race to win wars and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions, the Glider, a peaceful aircraft with a battlefield pedigree. Superglue, how the quest for better gun sights led to the perfect domestic adhesive. The Arga Oven, the luxurious stove with a World War II spy connection. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. Sailing silently through the air, the modern glider is a tranquil way to enjoy the experience of flight. But did you know of the struggle to achieve this, and the important role the glider played in World War II? For centuries, man looked to the skies and dreamed of flying, but with no understanding of how to do so. Various harebrained and wacky contraptions were created, but with little success and often resulting in injuries. Even great minds such as Leonardo da Vinci attempted to design a flying machine, but these were never realised. Technically speaking, a glider is a heavier-than-air aircraft that does not require an engine to fly and is supported in flight by the reaction of air against its lifting surfaces. By this definition, the first gliders that were capable of carrying a person and employing these principles were designed by Sir George Cayley between the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. Although these gliders only managed a few brief hops in the air, they certainly paved the way for future development. German-born Otto Lilienthal was the first person to make repeated successful gliding flights at the end of the 19th century, and managed to convince the public that flying machines may one day become practical. The early 20th century saw the first successful high-altitude glider flight by Daniel Maloney, and then, of course, came the work of the famed Wright brothers. By the 1930s, gliders that much better resembled the ones we know today were being used for sport. However, they also had a big role to play in World War II. The Nazis training pilots for the Luftwaffe, forbidden to have the aircraft by the Treaty of Versailles, used gliders to train their pilots. And then come 1940, the Germans were towing their gliders behind their transport aircraft. They had 10 men and they used these gliders to attack Eben Emel the great fortress as the Blitzkrieg rolled through Belgium, and they were very successful. The Allies also found an important use for these aircraft. Gliders were towed close to their target landing point and could then quietly land where needed, carrying heavy equipment and troops. Although no longer used by the military, today this versatile and wicked invention takes on many forms, from hang gliders to sailplanes, and is enjoyed by thousands of enthusiasts the world over. Pipistrel are a Slovenian-based light aircraft manufacturer that have been producing gliders since the 1980s with many awards and records to their name. We have produced more than 1,000 aeroplanes. Uh, we have been nominated the European Business Award for the most innovative company in uh, 2010 and we are extremely proud of having won all three NASA organized challenges for the best light aircraft. The production of a glider begins with research and development. So we have uh, an extremely good way of controlling what the product will be, in particular its structural side and its aerodynamic side. When you are talking about gliders, these are the two most important qualities. Lightweight, durable structure with extremely aerodynamic lines. And we have a full development of these two areas here in-house. 3D models of the aircraft are created in computer software. This allows the R&D team to run simulations on the planes. Tests here include virtual wind tunnels, which show how aerodynamically effective the glider will be, and also flag up any problems, such as whirlwinds forming around the plane. The shape developed in the R&D stage is programmed into an 8-axis CNC cutter. The machine then cuts soft materials, such as polystyrene or wood. These shapes can be either positive or negative. A positive shape can be directly used to form the shape of the aircraft and a negative shape is used as a mould. These moulds and shapes are then turned into real-life aeroplanes, using mainly composite materials such as fibreglass for the wings and carbon fibre for the fuselage. 
The fuselage is also reinforced with Kevlar that protects the glider's passengers in the event of an accident by preventing the carbon from shattering. Gliders need to be extremely lightweight, so we resort to high quality composite materials which are not normally used in the industry. So our products last decades uh, thanks to the uh, technology we have uh, introduced in, in procedures here in-house. The sanding, painting and shaping of the moulds, shapes and fibres is all done in a vacuum ventilation chamber to protect from dust and small fibres. The technicians then apply up to 30 layers of fibre into the mould or onto the shape and laminate this with epoxy resin. Composite materials such as carbon fibre are created by weaving carbon or glass fibres into a mat that can be easily moulded or shaped. When epoxy resin is applied, they turn into hard and strong reinforced materials with an amazing weight to strength ratio that makes them ideal for aircraft such as gliders that need to be light but equally sturdy. Every aircraft consists of around 5,000 different parts, each coming from over 400 suppliers. Because of this, keeping track of each of these is vital. All parts are checked on arrival and then given a barcode that plays a key role in quality control. These barcodes are unique to each part and even contain important information such as the weight. In fact, uh, we know the history and uh, the behaviour of each part which was introduced on a certain aeroplane. We know where it came from, we know its properties. Each part has received multiple quality checks before it is ever put on the aeroplane and made fly. During the final assembly, all the systems and subsystems of the aircraft are assembled and fitted. These range from pedals to the parachute rescue system, as well as the engine in the case of self-propelled gliders. These are all assembled from small component parts, such as screws and wires. Using the barcodes, a central computer also totals up the weight added by each part, ensuring the glider won't be over the maximum takeoff weight of 472.5 kilograms. Every glider is made to order, so the exact components used differ on each. They can range from a few basic instruments, such as height and speed indicators, to much more sophisticated equipment. The customer can also specify the location of each instrument, so the workers drill holes and fit these to order too. At the end of the assembly, all the aircraft are given a final ground check. Wings and tail surfaces are fitted to the fuselage and aligned with laser measurements. The glider is then weighed, and this weight is compared to the total weight computed from the different barcodes. Providing this weight is accurate, the glider can then be flight tested. Each aircraft is flown for at least five hours by a highly trained test pilot. These pilots will perform a wide range of tests to ensure all systems are working correctly. If everything is flawless, the aircraft is then serviced again in order to return to its zero hour condition. When this is complete, the glider is then ready to be sent off into the skies. The glider, truly a wicked invention. There's a good chance that at some point you need to use super glue. Whether you smash your mother's favorite vase or you fixed your child's toy for the hundredth time, super glue, or to call it by its chemical name, cyanoacrylate, is that indispensable companion to any household hardware cupboard. But have you ever stopped to think about its interesting past and the fact that its discovery comes from World War II? Well, we've got it covered. Adhesives have been used for thousands of years, from the use of birch tar in the Paleolithic age to the experimentation in using egg pastes and beeswax in ancient civilizations. But what about the super sticky glue we know today? Well, like so many great inventions, it was actually discovered by accident. In 1942, the scientist Harry Cooper Jr. led a team in the research to find materials to make a clear plastic gun sight. In the process, his group came up with a formula that was very clear, but would stick to anything and everything that it came into contact with. Deemed unusable for the original purpose, the team moved on and tried something new, but Cooper never forgot about his new adhesive. Because it wasn't what he was looking for, he left it to the side and didn't do anything until about 1951, when Kodak, of the, ca of the Kodak camera fame, rediscovered it and realised it could actually have a potential use as a glue. 
1951, Eastman Kodak took a look again at this product that they'd made and decided that this product, which stuck to everything else, could be commercialized into a glue for commercial use within the household and potentially other uses. Nine years later, in 1951, whilst working at Eastman Kodak, Coover recognized his new glue's commercial potential, and Eastman Kodak had it on the market by 1958. Let's have a closer look at this game-changing adhesive's chemical properties. Cyanoacrylate consists of monomers of cyanoacrylate molecules. It is an acrylic resin that polymerizes in the presence of water, forming long chains that bond the surfaces together. Because of its reaction to moisture, the glue will turn into plastic in just a few seconds. That reaction is what makes the superglue much more fast-acting and stronger than others. Superglue works and doesn't stick to itself in the bottle because it's actually a reaction with the cyanac cyanoacrylate and water. And this reaction requires water to work. If you keep it in a bottle that has no water, it won't work. It'll still sit as a, as a liquid. This is why if you take superglue, put on plastic bags, some of the older style ones, and stick them together, you can pull them apart after a few minutes because there's no water on the surface. Most surfaces we have, so wood, um, metal, fingertips, and a few other, and paper, have a very small surface, area, surface layer of water on them. And it's this water, it's actually the hydroxide, that is needed for the reaction to start. The water in the atmosphere helps the reaction happen. And if you're unsure when you, have, you actually use it, you can always just breathe a little onto the surface, just put some more water onto it, pour the glue on, put your sticky stuff together, and it should form a reaction and form a bond quite quickly. Did you know that this adhesive has even saved lives? It even came into use for soldiers looking for a quick fix solution to battlefield wounds in the Vietnam War. The army used superglue to stick wounds together in the Vietnam War. It's not advisable to do this. It was used as a stopgap because in the Vietnam War, if you were out in the middle of a jungle and were shot, you, the most reason, common reason for you to die was because you bled out. It wasn't actually the actual injury itself. So you needed a means to sort of close up the wound and hold it together before the operation could be done when you were transported to a better medical care. It's Dr. Coover of Eastern Kodak, he worked out how to apply it as a spray and specially trained surgical teams were involved with using that in the war to save lives. And that's not the only interesting superglue story. There are some misuses of superglue. If you remember that superglue is actually very quick to form the bond, so you want it to glue fast. There was a casino gambler who went into the toilets, sat down to do his business, and found that he was stuck to the seat because someone had put superglue on the seat. And when he sat down, it wasn't very long, and he was stuck to the seat. He then had to wander out into the casino with part of the toilet attached to him to try to get some help. Mishaps aside, when superglue is put to its rightful purpose, there really aren't many better ways to fix things fast. There are very few accidental discoveries that are so seemingly simple, yet as versatile and useful as this magnificent, fast-acting adhesive. Superglue, the wicked invention that sticks. Superglue may have amazing sticking qualities, but can it help solve crime? Maybe. There's been a burglary, but the sneaky thief left behind some sunglasses. Unfortunately, we can't see any fingerprints with the naked eye, and it is up to our intrepid tester to find the rogue's fingerprints, using nothing more than a coffee percolator and the power of superglue. So, how does this fantastic forensic trick called fingerprint fuming actually work? To begin, the materials. An old coffee percolator? Well, you won't want to use it again after this experiment. A metal tin lid, a tube of superglue, and the thief's sunglasses. Please remember that you shouldn't really do this at home, and if you do, remember that the glue is toxic and can easily stick to skin, so please take the proper safety precautions. How does it work? We take the tin lid and place a few drops of superglue onto its surface and carefully pop it into the coffee pot. We then add the piece of evidence to the pot, in this case the sunglasses, making sure it doesn't touch the glue. Well, we don't want a sticky accident. Now, in those immortal words, don't try this at home, we turn on the percolator, sit back and wait for the results. You need to be patient as the percolator gently warms up the contents of the coffee pot. While we wait, let's explain the science behind fingerprint fuming. The heat in the coffee pot will eventually cause the drops of superglue to vaporise. 
fingerprints are actually composed of sweat, amino acids, fatty acids, proteins, potassium and sodium, and the glue is highly attracted to these substances. So its fumes stick to the prints and will reveal a trace of the print, or so we hope. In this speeded up footage, you can see that process in action. And voila, we can now find out who the pesky felon is. So let's go get them. Cooking is for some a therapeutic and healthy activity, and for others a necessity. No matter which category people fit in, all agree that cooking can be very exhausting. Kitchen appliances have evolved in order to make the cooking experience a more enjoyable and easier one. However, from all the inventions and cooking appliances developed, there is only one born from the mishap of a science experiment and later sold by a World War II spy. This is the Arga Oven. The Arga Oven is one of the biggest revolutions in kitchen appliances during the 20th century. Its inventor, Nobel Prize winner Gustave Dallaine, had attempted to invent a porous substrate for storing gases. But the experiment went horribly wrong. An explosion occurred and Dallaine lost his sight. After this explosion, the physicist was forced to stay home and realised how exhausting cooking was for his wife. Despite being blind, Dallaine decided to design a stove that would be easy to use and capable of several culinary techniques. He asked his wife what the problems were in the household and she said, well, the fact she's always got to tend to the range cooker. I mean, working a range cooker, even if you've done it today, it is a full-time job. You have to keep it kind of fired with coal. You have to watch for temperature constantly. So he had been working on um, radial heat and came up with this design for an oven which would contain the heat, which once the heat was in it, would stay there and stay at ambient temperatures. So this is where the arc came from. It was the first like radial heat oven. He adopted the heat storage principle and developed a unit with two ovens and four stove plates. The Arga was invented. It was introduced in England during the 1930s under Arga, Rayburn and Stanley Brands. Initially, the oven was used with charcoal for slow burning. This invention became increasingly popular among the select few of English society. It's quite an iconic piece of design. I mean, they look stunning. They continually reinvent themselves, but into a kind of classic frame. Like no other oven or range or any kitchen appliance looks as evocative as an Arga. An Arga kind of screams luxury. And the link to war? Well, world-renowned master of advertising David Ogilvy actually started out selling Argas in his early 20s. He quickly made a name for himself with his new marketing techniques, and when World War II started, he was promptly taken away to the US to work for British secret intelligence. It was his reports into human behaviour that were later implemented by Allied spies all across Europe during the war. Today, this iconic appliance is seen as a vintage piece, a symbol of style and wealth. Very few other household inventions have had the impact that this oven has had and will continue to do so for decades to come. This is what makes the Arga oven a wicked invention. At the legendary Colbrookdale Foundry in Shropshire, the process of building the Arga starts with fully recycled and reclaimed scrap iron, such as brake discs, cast columns and old Argas themselves. The scrap is collected, mixed with alloying elements and fed into the furnace with coke fuel to reach temperatures of over 1700 degrees Celsius. When the raw material has arrived at the site, it is then put into the cupola furnace and melted. That's the first stage in the process which is key to us to ensure that the consistency and the chemical attributes of the product are right. The furnace can melt five tonnes of cast iron per hour. Once melted, the molten iron is taken to two of the mouldering lines in a container or large ladle. The molten iron inside is still at a blistering temperature of 1400 degrees Celsius. Well, the original challenge is getting the constituted parts cast together to produce the cast iron of which we're famous. Down at uh, Colebrookdale, it takes roughly about 20 minutes to do all the castings in total for an oven. Using a mixture of sand, clay and water, the moulding machine can create moulds of any oven part, door, front or top, that is needed. 
the moulding machine makes sand mould negatives of a pattern which are then split in half, so that when the two halves are put together, they create a cavity for the molten metal to be poured into. The two halves are clamped together and sent along a production line, where the molten metal is poured by an auto-pour furnace. Once the mould has been filled, it is moved along the conveyor belt, where the metal inside quickly cools. Once cooled sufficiently to 250 degrees Celsius, it is time to retrieve the castings. Each mould is sent down the vibrating grid. The vibrations break open the sand mould and the castings are revealed. They are inspected and any remaining mould is broken off by hand, then placed into bins to cool down further to room temperature. The fresh castings are sent to a shot blast, where steel shot is fired at the castings to remove any remaining sand particles. The brand new oven parts, made from the sand mould castings, are sent to a workshop on site, where using handheld and pedestal grinders, workers can remove any blemishes and rough edges to give the oven parts a nice smooth finish. The finished parts are then sent to the Telford factory, where they are prepared for Arga's famous enamel finish and assembly. The cast iron parts are coated with a primary undercoat and transparent enamel, which will protect the pieces in the furnace. Ultimately, one of the most difficult things to do is to get that superior finish that an Arga is well known for. And the two materials, both the enamel and the cast iron, have different rates of expansion. And one of the secrets we employ here is how we do that, and how we get that look. Enamel is made up of tiny particles of glass and is sprayed onto the cast iron. It is then baked in a furnace at 800 degrees Celsius until it is literally red hot. This fuses the enamel onto the cast iron. This process is repeated three times to produce a smooth, high gloss finish, which is very easy to keep clean. The parts, door and tops are all colour matched for each individual model. Next, it is on to the assembly line, known as the track. On the track, on the assembly lines, there's about eight to ten people, and now we've changed over to the made in the factory product. Obviously, there's the in-house testing, where the product is fully tested before it's shipped out to the customer. The finished oven parts are bolted together, and a heat-proof sealant is used to line the edges of each component. The oven starts to take shape as all the units are fitted into place. The two hot plates which sit at the top of the oven are fitted with insulated cast iron and chrome lids to stop the warmth from escaping from the cooker whilst it is not in use. And the heating elements are fixed on the inside, which can be either gas or electric. The ovens are then insulated with silicate wool before the enameled outer shell is fitted. And finally, the famous enamel doors are added to complete the oven before being tested prior to packaging and dispatched to the customer. The Arger oven, truly a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day but have never realised their amazing background. The glider, super glue, and the Arga oven. All wicked inventions.